Welcome everyone to this week's Autonomy Talks. This week is a pleasure to have uh, uh, two speakers, actually, Professor Roberto Galeazzi and Thomas Enevolzen. Actually, we are in a hybrid form today. Uh, some of us is here in the new offices at ETH, and some of you is, is virtual. It's good to be back on a somewhat uh, natural uh, scenario. So something about the speakers. Uh, Roberto Galeazzi is an associate professor of control theory and technology and the head of the DTU Center for Collaborative Autonomous Systems at the University of Denmark, uh, DTU. He leads the Remora Lab, which is an acronym for Reconfigurable Modular Robotics for Aquatic Environments. And there he looks into motion control of single and multi-agent underwater robotic systems. And the research includes aspects of sensor fusion for perception and navigation, mission planning, motion planning, and guidance and collision avoidance. Uh, Thomas uh, Enevolsen is, doing, is pursuing his PhD in the Automatic and Control Group at the same university. And uh, his research is also part of the shipping lab in the autonomy project. And there he works on collision and grounding avoidance methods for autonomous marine uh, surface vessels. We are very happy to have a talk from from this field, which is very, uh, very interesting to us. And uh, we look forward to hearing what the speakers say. Go ahead, uh, Roberto, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Joel, for the kind introduction. And uh, let me also talk uh, Professor Emilio Frazzoli and Andrea Cenzi for uh, inviting us here today to uh, present our work and, uh, and to see potential synergies out there. So the title of the talk, Informed Sampling Based Motion Planning for Collision and Ground Avoidance for Autonomous Ships, um, will uh, inform uh, about our research effort in the context of uh, autonomous ships uh, related to the aspect of uh, what we call short horizon way planning in the event of uh, collision or grounding. Uh, this part of the talk will be covered by my PhD student, uh, Thomas Wilson, but before getting there, I would like uh, to introduce uh, to you our university and, and the research project Shipping Lab in general. So uh, very briefly, uh, we both come from the Tech University of Denmark, which was founded in 1829 by uh, A.C. Hurstead. And the mission that uh, Hurstead defined for the university back then is still the same uh, today as it is reflected in uh, our current uh, strategy, which is named Technology for People. Um, DTU has uh, several uh, um, accounts, several places around Denmark, uh, but the main uh, so the research and educational activity occurs in the island of Zealand, in particular in the campus of Lindy, where both Thomas and I are located. The university counts approximately uh, 6,000 full time equivalent, of which uh, uh, almost 800 people are faculty, and we have, I would say, a decent amount of. Uh, PhD students across the many different uh, PhD schools. As uh, Joel mentioned, uh, I have the pleasure to head the DTU Center for Cloud Autonomous Systems, where uh, we are pursuing uh, a multidisciplinary research across uh, many different domains. The, the center was established as a um, as a unit that they should bring together the different uh, souls uh, coming from uh, our core engineering, you know, electrical engineering, space technology, and, and uh, so to say computer science together with the soft skills of uh, uh, DTU management in order to look into uh, research aspects uh, that uh, are not only to do with the, the building blocks of autonomous system, but also how such autonomous systems should interact uh, with humans uh, uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, but also at an organizational and a governance level. So I will uh, stop here discussing or uh, presenting the activities of the university and now more focused on, on the core of the talk. As I said, the talk is divided into two parts. The first part where I will provide a general overview of our research effort, Shipping Lab Autonomy. And then a second part, which instead, uh, where instead Thomas will focus on the uh, aspect of uh, planning for a collision and grounding avoidance. So uh, Shipping Lab is a collaborative effort uh, which would like to position Denmark as a driver for the future of smart shipping. It's a research and innovation network with uh, 40 partners, large amount of uh, national companies, five universities, a maritime academy, and also association and agency who have uh, 
an interest, of course, uh, into the development of uh, uh, digital technologies in general uh, for uh, the shipping industry. There are three main uh, research clusters, digital ship operation, autonomy and decarbonization, and uh, um, our research group uh, leads the autonomy effort and contributes to the digital ship operations for the aspect for the area of uh, maneuvering models for digital twins. Uh, the budget is approximately 12 million euros, of which 50% is allocated for uh, the autonomy uh, research effort. So uh, what are the main research objectives? Uh, our program revolves around the three level of demonstrations, one man operation of a ferry uh, with temporarily unattended bridge. We would like also to demonstrate decision support as add-on retrofit for vessel to enhance safety against ground and collision. Here looking at the a large uh, uh, amount of vessels that, uh, so to say, they are not uh, directly interested in autonomous operation as per today, or uh, so to say, uh, they could not see these as a viable business model, but they could, uh, so to say, benefit from some of the technology that could emerge from the development of the autonomous ship. And then uh, uh, last but not least, to demonstrate fully unmanned operation of our buses with built-in safety in the form of autonomous supervision. Here we have uh, our two demonstrators, we will demonstrate the decision support on board uh, of uh, one of the, the FTS, uh, say, uh, rural vessels, and uh, that are, so to say, uh, purpose of which is transportation of goods and cargo. And then the second demonstrator that will take place uh, in the fjord of Olbor uh, will instead look into this arbor bus. Uh, this is a cab design of the arbor that is current, sorry, of the bus that is currently under manufacturing, which will be delivered April next year for performing integration and final testing. In uh, the development of the autonomous ship, uh, we are looking at uh, uh, several uh, research and development areas that uh, uh, attack some of the basic uh, um, components of autonomous systems in general. So we look uh, into the aspect of situational awareness, collision avoidance, cyber resilient navigation, autonomous supervision, as well as, of course, elements that have to do more with the architecture and the integration. So, of course, how do we design from an architectural point of view an autonomous system and how do we integrate these different autonomous agents together in order to achieve a system which is safe and secure? So, why are we pursuing autonomy at sea? Well, mainly because of two factors safety and sustainability. Um, the European Maritime Safety Agency every year produces a, a report called the Annual Overview of Marine Casualties and Incidents, which usually has a look back period of five years to assess how the industry is evolving concerning uh, these, of course, uh, uh, issues in order to quantify what are, of course, uh, the uh, main reasons that are uh, the root cause of accidents uh, and casualties. And from the report, the recent report of 2020, we can see that uh, collision, content, and, and grounding are actually major causes of uh, casualties, counting for almost 50% of the total casualties in the period of 2014, 2019. And we can see that another important element is the loss of control of the vessel because of uh, loss of propulsion, uh, or the propulsion power and thereby failure of the propulsion system. An element to be, I think, uh, noticed is that uh, uh, despite uh, some technological advancement that uh, occurs, uh, uh, certainly occur over these uh, last five years, the uh, statistics of, uh, uh, so to say, the reason for uh, casualties seems to be more or less constant, uh, probably indicating a, a, a low level of actual integration of such a technologies across the entire fleet. Uh, if we look at some of the statistics uh, uh, of where accidents are more likely to occur, uh, we can see that uh, actually uh, casualties and accidents are very likely to occur, uh, mostly in internal and territorial waters. And uh, this, of course, uh, favors the case of talking about the autonomy at sea, uh, because uh, technology adoption is heavily regulated in this uh, in this line of business uh, by the so-called International Maritime Organization that defines, so to say, what type of uh, regimes uh, uh, different type of vessels can undergo, uh, which of course uh, will then determine if an autonomous ship will ever exist in so-called international waters, whereas in uh, national waters uh, everything or regulations can also be uh, pursued by means of uh, the 
uh, state flag, the, the national maritime authorities, which have shown in recent years a keen interest into seeing the, how this technology could develop in order to increase, of course, safety. There is a certainly uh, evidence that uh, when it comes to uh, accidents at sea, the human uh, factor is, uh, so we say, the determinant one. Uh, more than 50% of the investigated casualties in the period of interest is attributed to human action. And we can see that uh, most of uh, what is uh, concurring to uh, accidents is due to what is going on um, on board the vessel during operations. Uh, the other element is sustainability. Why? Because whenever there is an accident uh, that involves a cargo vessel, there is a lot of, uh, so to say, different type of pollutions occurring. Uh, there is air pollution, pollution due to bunkers, basically loss of fuel and oil, but also pollution due to cargo, especially if uh, these accidents uh, uh, involve uh, container vessels uh, of, some, of, uh, of some sort, as we can see here, for example, uh, two years ago, a lot of, uh, uh, so to say, items uh, polluting uh, uh, natural beaches and also, of course, the sea environment. So these are, uh, in my opinion, the biggest drives uh, from a societal point of view, safety and sustainability. So now if we look at more uh, uh, at the autonomous ship in, in a more larger context, uh, what is that uh, uh, from our point of view uh, we are doing here? Well, our uh, research revolves around the fact that we're not looking into so to say futuristic concept of how vessels will be in 20 years from now. We're looking in how technology could be uh, integrated into the existing fleet. And if we're looking in that direction, we need to take into account that the existing fleet has, uh, of course, uh, uh, sorry, already a certain amount of systems in place that uh, uh, are utilized, of course, nowadays uh, to perform the navigation of vessels. And uh, the whatever, uh, the autonomous system should bring uh, on top of these must be integrated with these existing systems uh, and uh, should make use of those as well and eventually offer additional uh, capabilities. So here in general, what we see is that, well, we will have a conventional vessel who has been designed uh, according to good engineering practice and has been approved by class and the flex state. Uh, and then uh, what we would like to add is uh, uh, systems concerning with uh, some sort of autonomous supervisor, voyage control, and also some sort of remote control center. Uh, in doing so, of course, it should be understood what type of functions should be allocated into these uh, autonomy uh, agents, uh, how do we integrate the autonomous system with the legacy systems on board, how we will perform test and validation of the ensemble, and what should be the acceptance criteria? How do we say that actually this autonomous system behaves as expected in known and eventually unknown scenarios? So in, uh, in doing so, uh, we found extremely important uh, to understand what, are, what is the regulatory regime around uh, uh, ships uh, operating in uh, uh, coastal and international waters, because these regimes uh, uh, will naturally play a role into the type of technology that needs to be developed. So here uh, uh, we can see that uh, IMO is, uh, which is the main, uh, so the same body, deciding upon uh, what uh, uh, can or cannot be done in the context of, uh, of ships. Uh, as a basic principle of no payroll treatment, namely that every new technology in order to uh, find its way uh, into vessels should offer the same degree of safety, security, and protection of the environment as a conventional technology already used. Uh, it's or important. Better. Sorry? Or better. Or better. Mm -hmm. or better, of course. But then there is a <laughs> the, uh, an important aspect is that uh, despite the uh, IMO has brought into his agenda the discussion about the uh, autonomous ships, uh, as per today, there is still not a regulatory regime in place, which means that uh, every testing of autonomous ships uh, is done through, uh, so to say, sea trials in very uh, defined areas, usually, uh, so to say, determined in collaboration with the state flag. Uh, Associate or uh, units like uh, uh, UNCLOS and IMO utilize the principle of skills affairs provided by uh, this uh, CTSW uh, convention. 
And substantially here, what the main point towards the development of ownership is that uh, the watch keeping officer, so or the so-called officer on watch is not allowed to leave the bridge according to current standard. The, the open point is that the bridge is not actually defined. So in principle, remote bridge operation may comply with the requirements, but these need to be uh, verified. The competencies required by the STCW uh, are specified the SSW and uh, uh, ultimately an autonomous system that should operate uh, eventually in the absence of crew should uh, pass the exam of a master manager. So should demonstrate the same level of competencies in facing, of course, specific scenarios as uh, master mariners do. So if we want to develop a certain... Uh, when you say master manager or master mariner, does it mean that there is a master manager that examines the system or uh, the should be able to get the master mariner license? Should you be able to get a master mariner license. Um, so uh, if, uh, if we look in this direction then and we want to de design an architecture that uh, is uh, at least uh, compliant with uh, uh, the current uh, regulatory regime, then uh, it's, uh, from our point of view, is essential to establish a, a certain uh, mapping of competences between what human beings, the captain, the chief engineer, the uh, officer on watch uh, do today and how these then competences and, and activities and, and tasks should be uh, accomplished by a, an autonomous system. And this uh, is uh, actually, we have proposed uh, an architecture that uh, established the presence of three, we can call them super agents, the uh, autonomous uh, coordinator uh, um, system, which uh, represent the, the role of the captain, we have an autonomous navigation system, which uh, uh, represents the role of the officer on watch. And then we will have uh, an autonomous platform system, which instead will embody the role of the chief engineer. We can see that uh, uh, certain uh, elements that pertains to the autonomous navigation system are those that are more uh, in focus within the development of autonomous systems as per today, not on shipping. Uh, whereas instead the legacy systems are those that uh, pertain mostly to these uh, autonomous platform systems, which are all the system connected with the uh, management, uh, power management, safety, the voyage control system, and so on and so forth. <coughs> so now I will uh, provide a, a very quick, uh, uh, so to say, uh, overview of some highlights of how far we have gone in our development. Um, the very first thing to, that is important for us is to show that uh, uh, we are actually performing this in close collaboration with industry and that industry is facilitating this process by, so to say, providing an actual platform that uh, uh, enables us to go out at sea, collect data, test algorithms, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, our uh, uh, sensing platform, which is installed here in the format of this uh, workbook, uh, as both a proprioceptive sensor and a ferroceptive sensors in order to know, of course, what the vessel is doing, but also what is happening in the surrounding of the vessel. So uh, one of the key area when it comes to um, research and development is certainly the uh, generational system for situational awareness. And uh, uh, we have several PhD students working within the uh, different aspects of perception. Um, here uh, is just a recent work that has been presented uh, a couple of weeks ago at the conference, which, uh, so to say, attacked the problem of uh, ensemble detection, as well in different spectral ranges. For operation at sea, we have found uh, very valuable to combine the information coming from different type of vision systems within the visible range, near infrared, and uh, uh, long wave uh, infrared, basically thermal cameras. And uh, here the idea is that the uh, different vision systems have different strength of weaknesses and thereby in order to improve the ability to detect uh, objects at sea, both static and dynamic, to actually combine the, uh, the use of, of the different, uh, uh, so to say, uh, vision system. So in this case, what uh, the, the research has been revolving around is uh, to exploit the established tools in uh, the deep learning in the deep learning community in order to uh, design uh, instant segment image segmentation uh, algorithms that uh, works on the RGB or uh, the visual range 
the near infrared range and the uh, thermal camera. And then uh, uh, substantial, as we can see here, in these two images, there should be two buoys. Uh, so in this image, there should be two buoys, uh, but uh, uh, only uh, not both of them are, are visible uh, by all uh, set of sensors. And thereby, by using this uh, ensemble approach, uh, which in this case, uh, maximize uh, the objective of achieving object detection, because we see that the misdetection are more dangerous than false positives. Uh, we are able actually to uh, improve the overall detection, uh, so to say, uh, performance of the of these vision system. So here we can see from a statistical point of view, looking at, uh, so to say, both our recall and precision varies over the size of the objects uh, in the visible range of, of the different vision systems how this uh, ensemble approach is actually able to uh, reduce to a very small fraction the amount of uh, not detected object for objects that are in the size range of 0 to 500 pixels. Here it's worth to mention that uh, in the marine applications, objects are usually quite far away. Uh, so of course, they're always resulting as a relatively small in the field of view of the cameras. Uh, another recent development, uh, which uh, so this, uh, looks into, uh, again, uh, the adoption of vision, but in this case, uh, not for detection, but well, still for detection, but in a completely different context here, is for arbor, in arbor navigation. Uh, we would like to combine the uh, available information from the electronic analytical chart with uh, the, um, the radar information, but also what the vision system could actually perceive of the surrounding of the vessel while, uh, for example, entering into arbor or leaving an arbor. And here the idea is to uh, use a semantic segmentation using subpartitioning and a pyramid like structure. So, essentially, taking an image instead of doing a segmentation pixel wise, which would be very costly computationally and time wise. Uh, the idea has been to sort of say to simply split the image uh, in uh, micro areas that could be easily uh, so say classified semantically as for example no water partial water water and then uh, wherever there is partial water this uh, uh, so to say um, part of the image is farther uh, subpartition until substantially there is a unique uh, uh, labeling of the area of interest once this is done, uh, the, um, the research has been exploring the use of projected geometry to generate a, a bird's eye view of the area in the surrounding of the vessel, which will enable uh, a, we can say an immediate fusion with information from uh, the electronic and optical chart and the radar, which naturally have this uh, top view, uh, so to say, uh, imaging of the surrounding of the vessel. So this is ultimately what uh, emerges from the use of, uh, once again, uh, tools from the, uh, within the convolutional neural network um, toolbox. So in, on the top is the prediction uh, that is generated as the output of, of the uh, learning system, which is able to uh, classify to a good extent where water is, where uh, there is no water and where, so to say, there is some uncertainty about uh, well, or elements that are, so to say, in between the water and no water. And then in the bottom is, uh, so to say, the outcome of this uh, geometric transformation that now substantially as uh, the vessel down here, like if we were looking at a, a radar or a sonar plot of some sort. And uh, now we can see clearly what is the part of, uh, so to say, of the arbor in front of us, which is uh, pre which present clear ways for the vessel to navigate through and what uh, there are structures that will occlude the passage of, of the vessel. Another uh, area of uh, uh, research, which is connected, so to say, with the full development of the situational awareness is uh, the use of uh, um, discrete event systems to develop the uh, understanding and anticipation components of a situational awareness. And uh, in here we are uh, utilizing uh, an automaton based framework, uh, specific situation awareness. And uh, in, in order to create this uh, autonomous navigation uh, supervisor, where substantially we have a, a coordinating agent that uh, receives information from a perception agent that has uh, the sole scope of flagging if a new element has entered in the, so to say, uh, field of view of the, of the perception, of the world perception system. 
And upon uh, such uh, uh, flagging, the coordinator will instantiate uh, an automata for each and every object that has been uh, perceived. And, uh, and these uh, automata then will have the, the uh, scope of uh, uh, understanding what is, uh, so to say, the expected behavior of such an object and anticipate what uh, the next action of uh, such, uh, for example, target vessel could be in relation to uh, the own ship. And uh, this, uh, uh, so to say, reasoning uh, layer serves also uh, to instruct then uh, the, uh, so to say, the algorithms that are actually in charge of the performing collision avoidance, because they will, of course, uh, raise the focus. Now we should perform collision avoidance with respect to this specific object and uh, looking at how this object configures itself according to or with respect to the color rates, this should be the type of action to be performed. And then the uh, path free planner should find out what is the best trajectory uh, or the best path to uh, avoid collision or ground. Uh, the last uh, highlight concerns instead uh, our research on cyber resilient navigation. And here we are, uh, we have been both concerned with the development of theoretical framework, which could uh, provide an a priori assessment of uh, the system resiliency given a certain uh, set or a certain package of uh, sensors available. And uh, here we relied uh, on our uh, um, uh, long-standing expertise in the area of uh, fault diagnosis um, and uh, fault tolerance control. So we have substantially uh, defined a set of sensors that are uh, likely to be present on board merchant, merchant vessels, according, of course, to regulations uh, by IMO. And then uh, based on these set of sensors, we have been looking into, okay, which relations can be established uh, between the output of these sensors and quantities of interest related to the, to the motion of the vessel, and then to use tools in structural analysis to identify uh, detectability and isolability properties. In, in this table here, just an example of, uh, we are, for example, we are assuming that uh, if uh, the GNSS position is not available, for either a fault in, in the system or even because of spoofing. And at the same time, also the automatic identification system uh, will not be available. What type of faults or malfunction we can still uh, detect in the remaining systems and thereby what type of functionality are still available to uh, resolve the navigation problem of the vessel. Uh, from the theory to the practice, uh, we are now finalizing a work that uh, looks uh, uh, specifically at navigation in coastal waters. And here uh, uh, we are uh, still uh, addressing the problem of uh, unavailability of GNSS because of fault or, or, for example, cyber attack. And the idea has been that uh, in coastal water, we should we could actually leverage uh, information coming from the radar concerning the, uh, the visible land uh, in the radar scan uh, in uh, relation to uh, the um, land, uh, land profile that we can extract from the electronic analytical chart. And uh, so to say, by correlating this information uh, by a matching algorithm to uh, provide a correction of the position of the vessel. Once this is done, this uh, initial estimate, which of course will be uh, somewhat uh, rough with an error that could be in the order of 100 to 150 meters, we could further refine by substantially exploiting ancient tools of navigation, uh, which is substantially based on trilateration. Uh, both uh, the electronic analytical chart and the radar contains information about buoys in a certain uh, geographical area. And by performing a, a probabilistic data association, we can actually match the buoys that we see in the radar with the buoys that we see on the NC, and then to utilize this in order to uh, refine the uh, position uh, of, uh, of the vessel. And by leveraging uh, or by this part of refinement, we're actually able to improve the uh, positioning to the order of magnitude of uh, 5 to 10 meters of error. And uh, here is just an example of a sea test that we did in the, uh, in, in, in the South Fiume Archipelago, where in blue we can see the GNSS track, and uh, in red is what the radar to NC matching uh, estimates to be the position of the vessel. And wherever we have these uh, uh, yellow dots is where buoys are also available uh, in order to further refine uh, the uh, position of the vessel. And we can see that uh, uh, 
overall it is actually possible in confined waters to have a system that is not GNSS dependent. And the, the final part of this work is actually then to generate a residual. So now we have a GNSS that provides information about where the vessel is, and we have an independent system that can also say something about the position of the vessel, and thereby we can perform a monitoring action on the GNSS itself. So this is uh, just a, a warm up of the talk by Thomas. I would like, of course, uh, to uh, give credit to all the people that are working in our uh, shipping lab, autonomous research group, starting from Professor Mons Blanke, who is the principal investigator, investigator, and uh, all our PhD candidates and developers who, whose work is what I have uh, uh, the pleasure to present here. For those who are interested, I have provided just a short list of references of the work that I have mentioned in this first part of the presentation. And now I will uh, leave the word to my PhD student to discuss the details of the plan. Okay, thank you very much, Roberto. And uh, my name is Thomas, and I will uh, continue the presentation uh, primarily on the topic of. Uh, collision and grounding avoidance for uh, autonomous, uh, large scale autonomous vessels. So the reason for uh, having an emphasis on collision and grounding avoidance for these large vessels is that the landscape in terms of the oceans vary quite heavily depending on whether we're crossing the Atlantic or if we are uh, navigating within confined waters. And, and these are just some, uh, some, uh, some, some shots from various Danish waters where we see that the, that the depth uh, varies quite a lot uh, within within the country, and here, of course, the uh, the lighter colours are the deeper waters, where the blue is is the shallower waters uh, in the bottom in the bottom screenshots. Uh, whenever we say larger marine crafts, what we're actually referring to are crafts, as uh, shown on the images. We're talking uh, row row vessels, container vessels, and so forth, where such uh, vessels are usually restricted in terms of maneuverability. And these restrictions come in terms of their draft, meaning how, how deep of waters they need to traverse, and also their turning radius. And typically, when we deal with these sorts of systems, we uh, are not able to actually actuate the actuators directly on the system. We have to interface with some legacy uh, track control uh, systems or schemes. And uh, for, such large systems, uh, for such large systems, we typically have a 20 minute look ahead. Uh, Whenever we speak about collision avoidance in, the term, uh, in terms of uh, marine crafts, we typically have two categories. Uh, open water collision avoidance, where we want to avoid uh, collision at all costs, while of course also um, adhering to the rules, which in this case is what we call the COLREX. And in the confined water case, what we would like to do is have some sort of trade-off between avoiding collisions according to the rules, but also avoiding grounding. And furthermore, we have uh, the single vessel encounters where we have to deal with uh, avoiding collision with one, in, one uh, oncoming target vessel, or we have these multi-vessel encounters where we have to deconflict a situation where we have to avoid one, two, or multiple vessels. And uh, typically these multi-vessel encounters, at least in the state of the art, are dealt with as a series of single vessel encounters. Um, and the reason why uh, that these uh, encounters are typically dealt with as a, as a sequence of single vessel encounters is due to the rules. And uh, the, these are the IMO call regs, which are the, basically the rules of the road for the for maritime domain. And uh, these consist of uh, 41 rules uh, where the literature primarily focuses on part B. So whenever you will see a, a piece of work referring to being call rate compliant, it's typically referring to rules uh, 11 to 18. Uh, at least these in terms of the planning aspect, this is what, where we'll lay our emphasis and also for the remainder of this uh, presentation. So the most important rules in this aspect, uh, for our particular domain is uh, rules 13 to 14, which have been nicely illustrated here above, where in an overtaking situation, we have the freedom to select either side of the, the vessel which we're passing. Uh, in a head-on scenario, as we see here, we have to go uh, on the right side uh, of the vessel, our right side. And the same thing for the crossing scenario, the vessel which we're crossing uh, with is supposed to do nothing, but we have to uh, move, out of, move out of the way. Uh, with rule 16, uh, defining that the, the vessel which has to 
give way, has to give way in ample time, has to signal to the other vessel that we are initiating our maneuver safely so that the other vessel is aware that we're actually taking action. And the 17th rule uh, states that the vessel which is being overtaken or, or, or being crossed has to maintain its current course and speed, of course, within the constraints of the environment. Um, and just uh, historically speaking, and also how it is determined today without any advanced equipment, is that these correct scenarios are typically determined based on the ship lanterns. So if the navigator is able to see a red or a green light, we know how the ship is positioned with respect to each other, or if the uh, navigator is able to see a white light, we know that we are approaching from behind. And uh, typically, uh, in open waters where we will be maintaining our course and speed until a collision scenario occurs. We use the notion of a CPA, which is the position of which these two vessels will be at the closest. And typically, if a limit is violated, uh, that means we have a fear of colliding or we feel unsafe. And uh, in order to know when to act, we use this notion of time until the closest point of approach. And typically, we will start acting within a, a few minutes before we reach the, the, the CPA. Uh, since adhering towards the Colrex is quite a hot topic within our research domain, uh, many different uh, approaches have been taken in order to, to force these constraints in the system. We both have uh, the hard constraints where we have to avoid areas which uh, violate the Colrex, as we see here on the left. But we also have it in terms of either potential functions, uh, in this case for an artificial potential field implementation, or as a potential function for an MPC-based uh, implementation. Um, so it seems to be a choice here if you want to go the constraint route or as a part of the, the cost function. Um, and within the collision avoidance and primarily collision avoidance, but also within ground avoidance, we have a lot of different uh, approaches. We have the discrete methods that, that are very famous. We also have sampling-based methods, uh, velocity obstacles, model predictive, model predictive control, and also artificial potential fields. And uh, one thing to note is that most of the literature concerns uh, smaller vessels, which have a very high maneuverability, and they can frequently change the speed and direction pretty rapidly. Uh, and also, they're able to customize control schemes in order to rapidly uh, actuate and, 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 uh, and uh, execute these plans. So since we're dealing with larger vessels, we, we took a step back and tried to identify what is the best approach for us to start dealing with some of our issues at hand. And uh, based on this, we, uh, and based on the information that we have available from the sensors and, and the maps, we chose to use a sampling-based approach for our collision and grounding avoidance. And uh, the, the main reasons for this is because we have an ability to directly compute the waypoints that will be inserted into the track control scheme. We are able to provide geometric representations of the maneuverability constraints of the call rates, and also in terms of the confined water constraints, since we have the map data directly available. And uh, we're also uh, working on the ability to leverage some geometric representations of the path error. However, there are, of course, also some drawbacks in terms of uh, using assembling based method. Uh, one of this being that uh, in terms of optimality, we have this guarantee of optimality as the number of samples that we select tend towards infinity. And also, uh, depending on the choice of sampling space, we might have a uh, spend a lot of valuable effort in over exploring directions which aren't, which aren't necessarily providing value to the solution. Uh, in order to deal with this, we we looked a little bit into informed sampling spaces, and uh, this was uh, originally popularized uh, back in 2014 by Gamma et al. And this was called the informed RT, where once an initial solution has been obtained, the search space is decreased such that uh, every time you sample, you of course have an increased probability of improving the solution. Um, and just a, another slide to show basically the main idea is that in, in the original informed sampling, when, when you find an initial solution, you bound the region by an ellipse, and this ellipse decreases as the solution increases. So um, motivated and inspired by this work, we recognized that the uh, main call regs 13, 14, and 14, uh, sorry, 13, 14, and 15, could be described in terms of this 
uh, half annulus or annulus like subset. Um, and for this particular subset, it's of course assumes that we're in open waters and uh, it's a single vessel that we're encountering. So we, we then devised a scheme for directly sampling this subset uh, in a uniform manner so that we are ensured that we preserve the original uh, optimality uh, guarantees of the algorithm. So in order to do so, we defined a, a sampling space where we, in order to find the initial solution, sample a half annulus or an annulus. And uh, we're able to do so using this, uh, using some inverse transfer, uh, transform sampling where we um, are able to compute this inverse CDF so just that, such that we can randomly sample a, a radius and also the corresponding angle. And uh, once we have then found an initial solution in this subset, we have a, a secondary sampling routine where we sample this half uh, ellipse. This, this, it also is missing the center, so we kind of call it this half elliptical annulus um, that will decrease in size as the solution uh, improves. Um, however, due to the uh, we're not in a, we're not able to invert the CDF as nicely as we could before, so we have to solve it using Newton Rapson. Um, but combining these two uh, sampling strategies, sorry. Why, why do you, do you need that? Uh, yeah. Uh, this because we only want to sample, we only want to sample these two quadrants without sampling the uh, the center. So we want to provide this uniform sampling without having to reject samples which fall within uh, a no go zone. So, um, as as all shown now is that we have this area where. We find an initial solution in the half annulus, and then we kind of converge towards the the optimal solution, which is is the shortest path within the within this subspace. Um, so we have this switching condition that once we have found an initial path, we continuously check whether or not the area represented by the half ellipse is greater or smaller than the the half annulus which uh, results in us uh, only searching for paths, which in this case is a crossing scenario that provides uh, correct compliance solutions uh, directly from the sampling scheme. Um, so, so this is a, our init uh, initial proposed uh, sampling scheme for open waters with uh, single vessel encounters. Uh, we then deal with, uh, uh, we then investigated uh, sampling schemes for confined waters and here's just a quick example of when we extract some geographical data from the charts. Uh, the polygon information is very uh, dense and very, um, very descriptive. And here we kind of zoom in on an area in Denmark where we have the land represented by these uh, orange uh, um, polygons. And the white areas are areas which are uh, shallower than six meters, where everything else is, is deep enough to travel if you feel comfortable at a six meter depth. Um, what the current uh, grounding avoiding schemes or collision avoiding schemes for confined waters are doing is that they are approximating the area by a rectangle or a square and then rejecting all the samples which fall within uh, waters that are too shallow or land. And uh, we, uh, we instead chose to uh, triangulate these areas such that we could directly uh, generate samples which are within these feasible depths. Um, and uh, in this case, this is a triangulation directly on the data which is available in the ENC. And uh, the, um, the contours have very high resolution uh, on the boundaries. But the reason why we haven't down sampled these is because we want to be able to guarantee that we don't remove information by, um, by, by down sampling. Uh, however, even though we that you're more likely to in the blue Yes, yes, exactly. Um, actually, here we can see two uh, case studies where the... Yes. Uh, actually, it, these triangles only... Yeah, they, of course, they, uh, these triangles are valid for all contours, which are six meters or deeper. So we then, based on the current shift that you're trying to oh, plan with there, so, so you can see that uh, this area here is... is we'll six meters. Yeah, so this is just a chosen uh, depth. 
Um, so if we had chosen a, a 10 meters at the depth, all these light blue areas in the middle would be yeah. removed. And then what you do, so you have all this at an angle, you move the area of the triangle. And we, triangle. Yes, exactly. So then we, we, by area, we sample the triangles and then we sample the triangle itself. Um, and compared to sampling the rectangle, uh, it's actually only a, a one additional call to a, a sampler. And what we of course show is that as we increase the number of samples that we want to generate, uh, we reject more and more how the area ratio is. So, so in this case, we of course have a, I think 40% coverage in terms of the, what, the feasible region to the non-feasible region, where here of course it's much uh, less. So we see great benefits in these highly constrained environments by using this triangulation scheme. Yes, yes. So, it, it, but it, it varies, of course, based on if we move to the Atlantic, we get we gain nothing from this. We might as well do the the right triangular scheme. But it's only areas where it's it's of course constant for the area that you choose, uh, because in this um, circumstance you would be, uh, let's say, you would be rejecting six out of ten samples. Where here you would be rejecting maybe uh, nine out of ten, uh, eight out of ten. So this is kind of why some of the curves are steeper because you of course have less water that are actually feasible. Yeah. So this is just this was one uh, initial improvement that we proposed and as part of this grounding aware scheme. Uh, uh, a secondary objective of, of this of grounding awareness is leveraging uh, the AIS system, which um, is it's a system that is mandatory on actually most vessels now. Any vessel that carries passengers, it's um, mandatory. It's also mandatory on, on ships which travel internationally with uh, 500 plus tons of gross tonnage, as well as 500 plus uh, tons of gross tonnage for when you travel. Uh, uh, this should actually be nationally, sorry. Um, and the AS system, at least in Denmark, we have a free uh, database which has got all the AS data from the past, I actually think almost 20 years. So we have a lot of information available of how navigators of various, various vessels have uh, been traversing these waters. Um, and one thing that we, we can see is that, of course, there's a correlation between uh, the vessel type as well as its behavior in, in confined waters. Um, and what we then realized was that we could uh, kind of leverage this in two ways. We could both leverage these past behaviors as some sort of performance index in the actual uh, collision avoidance problem, as well as we could use these past experiences to actually generate a new sampling space. So it's just that we could seek for solutions in the neighborhood of past voyages. voyages. And just some, some, uh, some, some, uh, some, some introductory stuff here is that we the AS messages contain a lot of information, but we're mostly concerned with the speed and the draft and the positions. And this is kind of just a limiting database to a region of interest and also removing vessels which move very slowly, stand still, or also rescue helicopters. We have those also part of the, of the data set. So we limited to vessels with certain drafts and we limited to a geographical area. Uh, what we then did initially was that we used a kernel density estimation to sort of obtain a, this probabilistic view of what the area looked like. Uh, and this is just the description of a p-variate uh, kernel density estimator, of course, using the Gaussian kernel. And uh, the initial results show that uh, as we uh, limit the database by draft and comparing it to the depth contours, we see that the larger the vessel, or in this case, with the less vessels with deeper drafts, they uh, are much more conservative in their behavior in terms of getting close to the, the boundaries of the depth contours. So all the blue area here are, are feasible regions for anyone uh, who has a draft of three or, or uh, three meters or, or greater. And as we limit the set and the region to, to so large drafts, we see that, of course, that the, the ships with very large drafts, they maintain some sort of equal distance to the contours to, to maximize their safety. How do you compare to the size? Uh, so, of course, uh, the, the map itself is not, uh, we don't have, we don't include the tide variation in the map. But I think that if you correlate the, the historical data to the tide information, I could also imagine you see uh, some changes because the nominal route of such a vessel is planned based on the tides, of course. 
but this this is nothing we've looked into yet. But this, this would definitely also be a correct. But, but you know, Denmark, you know, what would you have in India or what would you see? In the Mediterranean, we don't have much yes. tides, right? But in Denmark, I think we do. Yeah, we do have uh, some some tide impact. This is also something that the we the, the collaborators from the Maritime Academy are very aware that the system should know that that the tide can sometimes impact whether or not you're higher, uh, more likely to ground. Up. This is also definitely something that is uh, to be considered. Uh, at this point, we assume that the nominal route has this tidal information incorporated. Um, so, uh, so what we did then was we, did, we tried to use this probability map as some sort of uh, uh, part of the cost term in order to trade off between a safe traversal and uh, minimizing the, the distance of the path. So what we see here is that the yellow vessel completely disregards the uh, the grounding uh, aspect and uh, minimizes the path in order to move from uh, from the starting location to the end location. And of course, it does exactly what we expect. It it chooses the, the shortest path, so uh, the, no surprise. Uh, what we then do instead is that we try to uh, we try to mo uh, motivate it to uh, to follow highly higher traffic regions. Using this probability map, and what we see is then, of course, it it naturally follows the the past trajectories while also maintaining its uh, desire to minimize between the the start and the goal. And uh, what we see is that, of course, that if it tries to follow the traffic region, it will encounter an overtaking scenario where we deviate from the traffic and then return to this nominal region. And we do a, a similar thing here in the more con uh, confined or more constrained waters where. We have an overtaking scenario uh, where it overtakes the vessel. Oh, sorry, we have a head-on scenario where it then moves out of the way and uh, returns to the traffic area compared to the other one, which of course uses the minimum uh, minimum distance. So the, yeah. Um, if, uh, I mean, one argue that uh, if you can do the yellow trajectory. Yes. With the trajectory, less pollution, you know, get less faster. Yes, uh, this is true. Uh, but of course, due to uh, like some of the phenomena that we see when we're sailing, with you know some of the inaccuracies or uh, slacking the control systems, yep. we of course want to maintain a safe distance from yeah, the controls. Right? You could model that according to your perception and discussion. Yes. I think here is this a. Uh, uh, so I don't fantasize anything, but this is a common mistake that I see. Yeah. Just copying the humans just because. Yeah, of course. Because this is not grounding away. This is a, a human perception imitation, yeah, we, fear and inattention, yeah. aware position of us. Yes, we're right. basically imitating past navigators. Right? Yeah. yeah, but it's not really imitating, right? No, it, it's, 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 it's definitely an interesting discussion mm -hmm. whether or not it's something that should be followed as strict as this, but at least it's a, a we think it's a good starting point to kind of provide some sort of awareness in terms of the yeah. the, the boundaries of the contours, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think that the, the very big point, but basically, I don't think the goal is imitating humans, right? Because humans are not perfect. Right? No, of course not. Yeah. But I think there is a counterpoint, which is I think the real reason you have one this uh, is because uh, then you are very predictable in yeah. the eyes of the humans. Yes. So you should not imitate humans because they're good. But just because they're bad, <laughs> because <laughs> you yeah. don't want to be too good, but the way you're, you're unpredictable. I think that's a very good point. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, yes. So we then here we showed, of course, we could use this um, this uh, historical data to provide some sort of performance index. Uh, what we also then realized that if we want to replan or plan new trajectories which lie in the neighborhood of where past the navigators have. Uh, traversed, we could also use this approach to generate new sampling spaces. And uh, what we basically did was that we assume that we have some sort of autonomous system or robotic system, which has performed a repetitive task, which in this case would be these vessels that have sailed in the same area. And this data has then been, uh, been gathered based on some assumptions on the environment. Uh, what we then say is that, OK, we can, we can then compute this initial probability estimates of this region. And uh, what then happens if we have some changes to the environment where some of the data might not be valid anymore, but we still want to use the overall uh, coverage of the past data? 
So then we, we, we have this new description of environment where we have some past uh, data, which is, which is valid, and we have some new constraints to the system. Um, so what we do is we uh, take a look at this uh, kernel density estimates and the new environment and say, okay, how can we describe a, a, a final environment where we can generate configurations or states which are feasible? So what we ended up doing was that we, we, take, we took a look at this uh, kernel density estimate of the original data and the new constraints. And, uh, and based on the bandwidth that we selected for the kernel density estimate, it's here is of course very important to mention that the, in order for what I'm going to say now to work is that the kernel function has to be a, a finite support. It's not, it's not supposed to be Gaussian with internet support. It's supposed to be, we're supposed to know the limits of the underlying kernel function. So what we, what we then, uh, what we then found was that if we we erode or dilate the obstacles and boundary correspondingly, we're able to produce this new environment, which captures some of the behavior that we see in the past data, uh, which which then is described by uh, by this kernel density estimate, which is then located inside of this new final environment. Um, and there's some bookkeeping here that, of course, if we uh, if we truncate parts of a distribution, we have to renormalize in order to maintain its properties. Uh, but I think this is a little bit more clear if we show a uh, full picture, where we have some in, some data that has been sampled in some some system where constraints have changed. We compute a kernel density estimate where it's very clear that parts of the distribution fall outside of the of the new constraints. We then perform this erosion. We bound the KDE, and then based on this new bounded KDE, we can either sample it, so that we obtain some uh, biased samples of configurations that uh, that tie heavily to, the, of course, the shape of the kernel density estimate, or we can use the weights of the individual densities to produce uh, new samples, which represent the, uh, the prior geographical spread of the original data. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I think that the, for the marine case, it will be a little bit more clear. So we do the same thing here where we have the original data. This is uh, for some vessel class of some size. We see that they typically uh, traverse the waters like this. We compute the, the KDE where we choose the bandwidth based on where, what provides the best results for the underlying distribution. We then uh, erode and dilate the the obstacles, we, we dilate them and we erode the boundary such that we have this new description where we can then sample the KDE or we can uh, present or we can compute uniform samples of the KDE. Um, where this bias sampling is just directly sampling the kernel density estimate, where this uniform sampling is, uh, we're sampling it based on the inverse distribution so that we're trying to represent the area of the KDE rather than the density estimation, uh, sorry, density information. Um, and our reasoning here is that we're able to then generate points which, which lie in the neighborhood of, of where past vessels have uh, traversed. And um, because we do this erosion and, dilate, uh, erosion and dilation based on the bandwidth of the KDE uh, kernel function, we're able to guarantee that we will never produce samples that uh, violates the original constraints that we posed on the system, uh, simply because we know that there will be a bandwidth distance to the boundary. Um, and in the paper that is available on archive, we also show that we can apply this to the three-dimensional cases um, if this historical data is available. Uh, so to kind of uh, summarize what I what I showed you here is that we. We have a lot of emphasis in our work that we want to uh, try and improve the value of each sample for us for our sampling based uh, collision avoidance and collision and grounding avoidance scheme. We showed this uh, correct informed sampling space. We showed how to sample the depth contours uh, such that we have more efficient uh, samples uh, relating to the confined waters. And finally, we tried to show how we could leverage these past experiences both in terms of a performance index but also in terms of new sampling spaces. Uh, 
Some final challenges and future work that we are, are working on is that we have uh, a desire to incorporate more traditional aspects of the marine domain into our current algorithm, such as minimizing towards an original a nominal path. This is uh, what we have done for most of our work now is assuming that we know a, we want to maintain a, a straight line uh, path or we want to minimize between two points, but actual for a real marine system, we actually have a nominal path available. Uh, and we, we're currently working on a way to do this geometrically. Uh, we also want to include more marine oriented performance indices, such as uh, energy consumption or uh, over cost in terms of time loss and time delay. And finally, we want to ensure that the waypoints that we actually generate could be validated by a system on board a vessel such that they could actually be executed. There's some requirements based on the charts and so forth. This is something that the uh, that uh, when you plan your nominal path, it has to be validated through a system. So a deviation would also have to be validated through uh, such a system. And finally, we have touched, we've mostly focused on the single vessel encounters. However, uh, the multi-vessel encounter is a very interesting uh, situation because we have multiple stakeholders where each vessel has their own primary objective, which most often, of course, is avoiding collision and grounding. However, every vessel has its own secondary objective, which could be uh, in terms of time loss, minimization of time loss or delays, thinking here of port calls or ferries, which is very, very important to maintain time here, they might not care, care as much about fuel. Whereas we have larger vessels, which might uh, care more about fuel or the uh, energy consumptions due to environmental reasons. And finally, we have just a, in general, a difference in behavior based on what shipping company you're working for, uh, what your cultural background is, and you know how how upset your boss is with you, and, and so forth. So we have a, we have a lot of different behavior that we can't really determine uh, and encode the way that we we have done previously. Uh, and and one way to benchmark this is using uh, some problems which are called the Matsu problems, which are a selection of um, 42 problems, which uh, show some complicated multi-vessel scenarios that, uh, that kind of break down the original assumptions within the call rigs. It's only the first few where you could actually solve them using the, 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 the original interpretation of the call rigs, whereas the, especially these uh, right-hand problems, uh, interpreting the call rigs becomes very challenging if you have to adhere to also all the rules. Just to round off, we think, okay, uh, we used to have video, but uh, we had some nice videos of, um, you can check the links afterwards. Oh, yes, here we go. So one thing to see here is, of course, noticing all the vessels that are being passed, mostly here in the this scenario. All that you're seeing here, all these lights, these are actually uh, vessels, which uh, shows that, of course, leaving these very congested harbor areas, you're actually in very close quarters to these vessels compared to our previous assumptions where you have 20 minutes of uh, head time to deal with them and such. And, uh, and here you have various behaviors. You can see all of these vessels that are either entering the harbor or, uh, and, or leaving the harbor or just anchored. Yes, because I think this is actually uh, from, from Singapore. But, um, yeah, yeah. So, so one of these is uh, Singapore, and the other one is uh, Hong Kong. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, of course, these are all of these videos are, bit, uh, of course, not by us, but by Angelo here. And you can, of course, he's, he has a very nice blog post where he details the complexities of these hardware environments. But then uh, finally, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much for your attention, both on behalf of me, but also Monsieur Professor Roberto. And we would also like to say thank you very much to our project sponsors, as well as the uh, Danish Geodata Agency for providing the uh, navigation charts.
So, um, yes. Questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's any question from the digital audience you can unmute yourself and ask directly. So, one thing I'm not, I was not really convinced about, because I didn't, I didn't remember the data. Right. Uh, so, we're talking about these maneuvers have a very uh, the dynamic is very slow, right? Yes. So I wonder how long does it take to plan one of those trajectories compared to executing it? Yes, so uh, of course this will depend on the efficiency of the underlying implementation, but what, but what we usually, at least in for these open water encounters where we have a lot of, uh, of time to compute, we will allow up to like to a minute and 30 seconds to to compute these deviations because we know well in, well in advance that we have to act, but this deviation doesn't have to be executed until maybe five minutes into the future. Uh, so we have a lot of available computational time. Right. Yeah. The dimensions on these big ships are mostly steel, right? So you don't change, you don't speed up. No, down. yeah, that's correct. So actually what we have showed here is that we assume that we're able to, we don't change the speed because uh, if you change the speed, you'd actually initiate initiate the maneuver by either reducing or increasing. You wouldn't actuate the speed while you are performing your maneuver. That's that's what you would do in these smaller memory graphs. But for the larger ones, you maintain speed or you change it, and then you do your maneuver. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Most of the work that you presented was about this, uh, like a rejection something, some form. Yeah, like or right. avoiding rejection something. Right. Yeah. But, you know, yes. For, for doing, yeah. to, to get, to get a distribution that you like. Right? Yes. Um, you didn't talk much about the codex, per se, right? No. Um, how you handle the multiple vessel of income, right? You no. just said, you know, how you send them. Yes. So what we what we're doing is very similar to what we showed in the state of the art that we we also model model the call rates as a as a constraint. So we model model them as like no go shown uh, shaped based on the on the scenario. I think you I think you've seen this before, um, and uh, and then we able to deal with it in this way. And that's also uh, I don't believe that it's the best approach. I think that this this. There's good and bad things with doing it as a constraint, but also doing it as like a cost function. Uh, but I think that for these complex um, multi-vessel encounters, I think that the both approaches they need some work in order to actually be able to solve these uh, situations. And that's also where we are venturing into right. now. And there are a few things that actually, I mean, said, not just from experience. Um, one of the assumptions in Corex is that you have a standby vessel and a, and a giveaway way vessel, yeah. right? And the assumption is that this standby vessel, you know, once, so they, they, they must keep speed and course, yes. right? But what, what if the standby vessel doesn't know that they're the standby vessel? So if I don't know that I'm being, I'm being considered as a standby vessel for somebody, how do I know that? So, you know, that I'm ah, okay. also, right? so um, uh, also, uh, so I think that what you mentioned in that, for example, you have the head on encounter, yeah. both vessels have to go to the right, but it's not actually the case. I mean, uh, there is no rule that says that both have to go to the right. So you just sort of negotiate, right? Well, so, and you know, and, and then there's exactly the reason why on roads we decide, okay, guys, everybody drives on the right or everybody drives on the left. I think that's because exactly the point is to avoid the, you know, killing eyes. Yeah. It happens quite often, right? Like, but so you know, people your first one way and then maybe you don't see that clearly. And, and so the guy doesn't know that since you initiate, so you, you think that you are the heat wave vessel or you know, you're doing the maneuver and they're also altering their demand. So, and you see, the, you know, the corrects, you know, in principle, by the sign, were things that were supposed to be complete and well sound system, and in fact, they're not. Yeah. Right. 
So this is the, the kind of situations yeah. where you know, you know something a bit more is needed. Yeah. But I think that regarding this with the stand-on vessel is that of course if you have a situation where you have you see a vessel that they are the stand-on vessel, you have to give way, but this vessel also has to give way to another vessel. Right. So they're not no no. So then in, with respect to us, they of course are the stand-on vessel, but then this assumption with the course of speed breaks down. But this is where the navigators then reason that oh, but we know how the situation evolves, so therefore we know to take half as much uh, action as we would have given that there wasn't another vessel. And this is and this is where we believe the challenge also lies and how do you actually quantify like these half right. So yeah. that's exactly yeah. the point, right? So that yeah, initially according to the rules of the road, yeah, for the cauldron will be enough. And then as you start working with the same, you know, there's that well, this is not enough, right? Yeah. So there are all of these things that okay, you rely on the navigator or you know, you rely on the driver to interpret the situation, yes. or you rely on the judge and the jury to decide who was wrong, right? Yeah. So, and exactly what yeah, this is also what we realized, at least in these scenarios where all of the stakeholders interact with each other, but, uh, where multiple vessels have to give way to different uh, vessels and so forth, that we, we probably have to utilize a different system. Um, yeah. Our line of thinking is what represents, say, the, the bottom layer. Okay, now we have a system that can generate trajectories in certain scenarios. Uh, under the assumption, of course, uh, rules are valid. And now we are entering into the phase of say, okay, this works fine in one to one cases where the rules are clear and transparent in the best possible way. But of course, we will handle multiple. Stakeholders at the same time need a, a reasoning which can uh, leverage this layer, but it can also, to say, uh, so to say, reason and hope with new information and also looking at how over time the situation progresses because otherwise it will, uh, I mean, it will remain a bit of a, uh, I mean, it will work only very well defined scenarios, not, cannot be generalized. Something I'm interesting was the fact that you kind of divide, um, you know, the constraints depend on the draft of the vessel, right? Yeah. So, you could also imagine Yeah. 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 So there, there is um, our behavior and other vessels' behavior is definitely dependent on what type of vessel we are. Uh, also, the, how close you would get to different vessels also really depends on if it's a super tanker, you of course wouldn't get close to it because the super tanker itself would feel very uncomfortable that you as another craft gets too close to it. So our behavior like is also dependent on the sort of thing. And this is of course not considered in what we are doing here. We're just thinking of it in a little bit more general sense, and trying to add this additional complexity based on the draft. All right. Thank you very much again for giving the talk. Thank you. The discussion will continue. Now, um, thank you very much, and see you all next week to the next round.